Hello, my name is Manoa Uffelman and I teach history here at Austin Peay State University. Today I'm going to be talking with Marjorie J. Spiral, Distinguished Professor Emerita at the University of South Carolina. She writes about women, politics, and the American South. Her most recent book is Divided We Stand, The Battle Over Women's Rights and Family Values That Polarized American Politics. She is the author of New Women of the New South, The Woman Suffrage Movement in the Southern States, and she has edited five books on suffrage. In 2020, she published a new edition of One Woman, One Vote, Rediscovering the Woman Suffrage Movement. This had first been published in 1995 as the companion volume to the PBS documentary, One Woman, One Vote. She was a consultant to the National Archives for the exhibit, Rightfully Hers, and an advisor for the documentary by One Vote, Woman's Suffrage in the South, produced by Nashville Public Television. Marjorie, we're really glad to be talking with you today. Now I was pulling out your books. I have a signed copy by you from 1995. Wow. I, w I went to the Southern Festival of Books and you were on a panel back then, 1995. That's right, there in Nashville. You've been doing this a while, huh? Isn't it amazing? That's what I said, I, I know you're a pro. <laughs> Well, I took about, you know, 15 years to work on a different topic, but I'm back. We're so glad you could talk with us because you were supposed to come to Clarksville and can't because of the pandemic. So we're going to talk to you anyway. I'm, I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to come too because I think that there's probably never a time in my whole life again where I'll be asked to give a speech at the dedication of a statue. I was very honored, and I'm so sorry I can't be there. Tennesseans are very proud of the fact that our state passed the 19th Amendment and women gained the right to vote, but there's a whole lot more to that story. Can you take us back to the beginning of suffrage? Yes, it is a long, long movement. If you can date it from different times, starting in the 1830s with people first speaking for women's rights, Maria Stewart, the Grimke sisters, Abby Kelly Foster, uh, Lucy Stone. But it starts really as, as a movement in 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention in New York, where a group of women led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott uh, called a convention on short notice and hundreds of people came to this tiny little town and they had this meeting at which they drafted what they call the Declaration of Sentiments, talking about what demands needed to be made to make it a more equal society for women. And one of those demands was for the vote. That's how it began. And that was extremely controversial, wasn't it? Yes, it was extremely controversial. And in fact, a lot of the people who were there didn't even want to sign it as a result. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's husband, Henry, who had political aspirations actually left town when he found out that they were even gonna bring it up. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton did not shy away from controversy. And in her view, the publicity was going to help them. It was going to spread the word, get people talking about it. So, yes, it was very controversial, but, and it narrowly passed. And it was because of the eloquent persuasiveness of um, Elizabeth Cady Stan and Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, of course, um, had escaped from slavery only about uh, 10 or 15 years earlier had become internationally famous for his autobiography, and at that time was a newspaper editor in nearby Rochester mm -hmm. and very interested in equal rights for all. And he came to the convention and uh, supported the, the idea that they go for suffrage. So there was a clear connection between suffrage and abolition. Can you talk a little bit about that? The woman suffrage movement was a direct outgrowth of the anti-slavery movement. And nearly everybody who was involved in the women's movement in its early stages was also involved in the anti-slavery movement. Some were also involved in temperance, 
but definitely um, the anti-slavery movement was uh, extremely important to them and something that brought them together. So after the Civil War, suffragists really thought that they would get the right to vote, but that's not what happened. Can you explain? As we were saying, the women's movement was closely tied to the anti-slavery movement, and um, they had a lot of support from, from men who were involved in that, or at least one faction of the men. And so they thought that as they went forward, that there would be an expansion of rights for both women and African Americans. But then when the Reconstruction Amendment started to be debated, Wendell Phillips, who had been one of the key allies in the anti-slavery movement and who strongly supported women's rights, he put out the word uh, in a speech to the group that uh, this was the Negro's hour, um, that women's hour would come later, but that it was important for the success of gaining the vote for African Americans fresh out of slavery, needing that um, that tool to protect themselves as the white South was doing everything they could to recreate the conditions of slavery as much as possible. He, he believed it very strongly that this was the most important thing. And they also believed that they would not be able to get all of the states necessary to ratify the 14th Amendment first and then later the 15th Amendment uh, if they included woman suffrage, which was still so controversial. This caused a big split. So can you explain the split in the suffrage organizations, how very good friends became on the opposite sides? The fact that women were left out of the Reconstruction Amendments led to a schism in the ranks of the women's rights movement, right at the time that it's coming to focus so much on suffrage. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony uh, headed one faction, the National Woman Suffrage Association based in New York, and Lucy Stone, with the aid of her husband, Henry Blackwell, sister-in-law, Antoinette Blackwell, um, Julia Ward Howe, the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and others, um, had the American Woman Suffrage Association, which was based in Boston. But the People have talked a lot about what were the differences, is it a matter of style? It was about whether or not they supported the 15th Amendment. And uh, Lucy Stone and her faction wanted that right to vote just as much as anyone else. But they just felt like that since they had been unsuccessful in persuading um, their allies and Congress to include women, um, and to enfranchise women, then um, they were not, that they felt like that they must go ahead and support it. And at Stanton and Anthony said that they just weren't going to, to work for it. They weren't going to support it. Um, and one thing that's important to understand here is that it is sometimes said that Stanton and Anthony did not want suffrage for African Americans, and that's definitely not the case. What was so upsetting to them is that their goal was universal suffrage for all, regardless of race or sex. And so when there was this era of reconstruction, when all questions were being reconsidered, and all this discussion about who should vote, and when the federal government got involved for the first time, in influencing the states in regard to who could vote in those states. They felt like it was an opportunity that would, wouldn't come again for a very, very long time. And that's why uh, Susan B. Anthony famously told Wendell Phillips in his office, um, I would rather cut off my right arm than to work for suffrage for the Negro and not for the woman. And then Southern states dis disenfranchised black men. The issue of the 15th Amendment turned out to be a issue of lasting importance in the woman suffrage movement because uh, after Reconstruction, as conservative white men 
worked hard to regain control of the South in Southern politics and to firmly establish white supremacy in politics. They just did everything in their power um, to keep black men away from the vote and to virtually disenfranchise them. They did this first through fraud and violence and then during the 1890s, period from around 1890 to 1903, they uh, tried to, to change their state constitutions or their voting requirements in various ways that they could get around the 15th Amendment and set up other qualifications other than race um, to keep them from voting. Things such as poll taxes, uh, which and, and difficult times for registration and residency requirements and understanding clauses, which meant that someone attempting to register would have to interpret a section of whatever document the registrar put in front of them, usually some part of the constitution, to the satisfaction of the registrar, always white, and someone who was entrusted by the community with keeping as many African Americans from voting as possible. So it drastically curtailed um, the vote, the black vote in the South for many decades. Uh, also uh, cutting into the poor white population who were illiterate. Um, and many people thought, well, Congress or the Supreme Court is gonna step in and not allow them to get away with this, but they did not. And in fact, this situation went on all the way until the 1960s when another movement to expand suffrage to gain fair voting rights came about as part of the civil rights movement. And fi finally, when Congress passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, what they were doing was using the power to finally enforce um, the 15th Amendment and to allow African Americans to gain the voting rights that had been established through that amendment. And of course, um, through the 19th Amendment, which gave all women who were citizens of the United States the vote, but it was the states that did not allow them to claim that right and, until 1965 when Congress finally moved to enforce it. How did the women's suffrage movement re-energize to lead up to the 19th Amendment? In 1869, when the, the suffrage movement divided into those two parts, both sides kept going. They just were working in somewhat different ways. The American Women's Suffrage Association went about working state by state to get more and more states to change their state laws to enfranchise women, and also to get any kind of partial suffrage that they could. That might mean allowing women to vote in municipal elections or school board elections or anything. And they believed that any kind of suffrage that, that they could get was a part of educating the public to accept the idea all toward this larger goal eventually of a federal amendment but they just didn't think you could get a federal amendment at that time. And the National Women's Suffrage Association went about things in a, in a different way. They were very slow to give up on the idea of gaining women's suffrage right away through federal action and were desperately opposed to the idea, as they said, of going around state by state and begging all these men to give them the right to vote. And Stanton just said, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. So they did things in a, in a variety of ways. And part of it was to you know, uh, introduce another call for a new bill that would enfranchise women. Uh, they hoped it would be the 16th Amendment, but as we know, that didn't happen. And uh, when it finally did happen, it was the 19th. But they also uh, tried to use the courts. And in the 1870s, in what they call the New Departure, Lots of women in the North went to the polls to try to persuade the registrars to let them cast their ballots 
uh, Susan B. Anthony was one of these. And what she hoped would happen is that she would be arrested and imprisoned and that she would be able to take it to the courts and that her case would rise all the way up to the Supreme Court where they hoped to make the argument that the 14th Amendment um, had said that all citizens should get the right to vote and that women were citizens and therefore that they should and that the part uh, that specified something about men was just in some additional enforcement clause. Okay, so the Supreme Court, uh, unfortunately, in the, uh, did not um, buy that. But Anthony wasn't the one who got to get it all the way to the Supreme Court because her, uh, her lawyer paid the fine and then her case was over, much to her disgust. But if, uh, a couple of years later, a woman named Virginia Minor uh, from St. Louis was able to get the case all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1875 then, in Minor versus Happersett, very important Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court ruled that citizenship did not automatically establish the right to vote and that for women, this was going to have to be decided state by state. So in 1890, the two sides finally buried the hatchet and got together again in the National American Woman Suffrage Association, the NAWSA. And that really begins the, a 30 year push towards the federal amendment. I certainly hoped it wouldn't take that long, but by that time, both sides understood that in order to get a federal amendment, they were going to have to win enough states that eventually it would be irresistible for Congress to deny women this federal woman suffrage amendment because there would be so many members of Congress that were beholding to women voters that they would have to vote for it regardless of their own beliefs. And so both sides began this, this work towards getting suffrage state by state, but again, always with the goal in mind of a federal amendment down the road. And then the suffragette movement in England influenced the American suffragists. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, of course in England, they also had had a woman suffrage movement for quite some time time, led by Millicent Fawcett, and it was very similar in taking this persuasive tact and lobbying uh, parliament. Um, but later in both the women's movement in the United States and in Great Britain, there were um, militant suffragists who were very impatient with this slow pace and with uh, the moderate approach and their, their feeling was, we want this like yesterday. Uh, this is absurd that we still don't have the right to vote. Um, and the, the British led off with this. Um, the term suffragette comes from the British press, which was using it as a diminutive to put them down, but as a means of uh, distinct, distinguishing themselves from the larger, more moderate group they embraced that term and, and again, calling themselves suffragettes. And um, that's where that term comes from. But in the United States, the militants never used that term for themselves with the exception of one small group in New York City. Um, but for the most part, they disliked the term because it was what they were always called by their enemies. The way that we usually think about their influence is through Alice Paul, who became one of the most important leaders of the American suffrage movement in its last decade. Uh, she was a young woman uh, who was in graduate school in political science and st studying in London. And there she encountered this militant suffragette movement and was just extremely impressed. She was moved by that militant spirit and she marched with them and demonstrated with them and went to jail with them. Um, what was happening was 
they were engaging in these civil disobedience techniques um, and the British were, they were also engaged over there in um, violent acts like uh, breaking windows and setting fires and things that um, Alice Paul, who was a Quaker, uh, definitely did not bring back to the United States. Uh, she, she admired their other tactics, but definitely not the violence. But she learned a, a lot from them. And she, when she came back to the United States in 1910, she and one of her key allies, named Lucy Burns, um, immediately started asking the National American Woman Suffrage Association, well, what are you doing? And why haven't you had any victories in a long time? And uh, why are you not working harder to lobby Congress? And the NAWSA at that point was still working towards getting enough states that they felt that it was time to push Congress again very hard. Um, and so they weren't doing much and, and Alice Paul was disgusted and she took over leadership of a, a part of the NAWSA called the Congressional Union. Um, and she began to uh, do some brilliant things with the press, including one of the most famous instances in the history of the American woman suffrage movement and that was this fabulous parade down Pennsylvania Avenue on the eve of Woodrow Wilson's inauguration in 1913. Estimates vary, but it's somewhere between 5,000 and 8,000 suffragists marched in Washington, D.C., uh, many of them dressed in white, um, on floats. Uh, Inez Milholland, a, a suffragist from New York, um, a, beautiful woman, a lawyer and activist for women's rights and the rights of African Americans, led that parade, mounted on a white horse, wearing a crown and huge wings and flowing white robes. And um, it was just an incredible spectacle. And it got a lot of attention from the press. Unfortunately, lots of people who were watching that parade uh, a lot of them were men who had come in because they were excited about Woodrow Wilson. A lot of them were Southerners who were not at all in favor of women's suffrage, uh, who were excited because a Southerner, Woodrow Wilson, who had been raised in the South and had Southern attitudes about women's rights and African Americans' rights, unfortunately, was going to be president. So they were largely the audience as these women parade down um, Pennsylvania Avenue, and they began to throw things at them and assault them, uh, hurl liquor bottles at them and lit cigars, and, and then to break through the police ranks and tear down their banners and uh, push, pull them off the flo floats. And, and it was a horrible scene, and the DC police stood by and did nothing. Uh, it's kind of funny, but in the end, they had to bring in the cavalry from a nearby fort to come in and break this crowd up so that the ambulances could even reach the injured in order to get them to the, to the hospitals. But Alice Paul recognized that uh, this actually was helping the cause because it added a great deal to the publicity. And more importantly, it, because the wives and daughters and friends of a lot of members of Congress were in that parade and among the injured, Congress actually launched an investigation into why the police hadn't acted and, and, and how this had, could have happened. Um, so Alice Paul was brilliant in terms of her relations with the press. And she, again, used some of the tools of civil disobedience that were later used very effectively by Mahatma Gandhi in India and by Martin Luther King and the American South um, to break the law and raise people's consciousness about unjust laws. Well, that leads us into Woodrow Wilson's uh, administration and World War I. When World War I broke out, by that time you had um, Alice Paul as leader of a separate organization called the National Women's Party had broken off from the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Um, and they chose when the war broke out 
not to support the war effort, but to continue their focus on one thing, and that was getting a federal woman suffrage amendment. While the National American Woman Suffrage Association calculated that if the best thing that they could do to help the, their cause was for suffragists to very visibly support the war effort. And Carrie Chapman Catt decided to do that despite the fact that she had been a lifelong pacifist, but she just recognized how, what an opportunity that was and how important it was. Um, and so Alice Paul and the National Woman's Party um, had already begun to demonstrate outside the White House and everybody thought, well, now surely they'll stop when, when the, now that the, there's a war on. But they didn't stop. And that infuriated crowds of onlookers, including soldiers and sailors. And so the crowds began to attack them. And again, tearing down their banners, knocking them down. And the police intervened, but not on their side. The, Police didn't arrest the attackers, but they arrested the suffragists and hauled them off to jail. And when they still persisted in doing this, they began to impose these lengthy prison sentences, sending them to uh, a, a prison uh, nearby DC called the Occoquan Workhouse and putting them to work um, and exposing them to terrible conditions, again, trying to convince these women to stop. But instead, they began to go on hunger strikes. Alice Paul was eventually, uh, first they kept her off the picket lines saying, you're our leader, we don't want you to go to jail. But she finally just got so disgusted with it that she said, I'm leading the next march, and she was off in jail. And they isolated her in solitary confinement they sent psychologists in to investigate her and quiz her and to try to get her to admit that she was um, opposing the president of the United States during the war, which was a crime. And um, she evaded the, the questions, but she stayed true to her principles and she uh, would not give up her hunger strike and eventually the public opinion, um, the sympathy for the militant suffragist um, caused the Wilson administration to eventually release them, whereupon they immediately, along with Alice Paul's ability to work the press, they dressed in replicas of their prison uniforms and chartered a train and went around the country on what they call the prison special, uh, telling the country about what had happened to them. But one of the most important things about the relationship between the war and women's suffrage is that the war helped the women's suffrage cause um, in two ways. One, because these militant suffragists who were picketing uh, the White House, they were holding banners that said things like, uh, Woodrow Wilson, you say that this is a war to save democracy while half of American uh, citizens are not allowed to vote and, um, and then calling him even Kaiser Wilson, which is one of the times that the crowds really reacted. Um, so they, in other words, were embarrassing Woodrow Wilson in front of the world um, by reminding the world that the United States was actually falling behind a lot of other countries that they were trying to lead um, as far as the issue of woman suffrage was concerned. And meanwhile, the, woman, Amer the National American Woman Suffrage Association led by Carrie Chapman Catt was uh, putting pressure on him in other ways. Um, by this time, they were very actively lobbying Congress um, and sending in waves and waves of, of women uh, to carefully study everything about each individual member of Congress and to 
use all their powers of persuasion that they could, they and their male allies. And uh, so Woodrow Wilson felt more comfortable dealing with them while he was furious with the National Woman's Party. But um, most scholars agree that the combined efforts of um, the, the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which was supporting the war effort and making Woodrow Wilson grateful, along with the National Woman's Party, which was embarrassing Woodrow Wilson in the eyes of the world and creating public sympathy by the way he partially treated them, uh, that the impact of both of those things led him to eventually drop his opposition to woman suffrage by federal amendment and to call on Congress to adopt the federal woman suffrage amendment. So now we're getting to the perfect 36. <laughs> yes. The happy part. So in June of 1919, finally, Congress approved the federal woman suffrage amendment and sent it to the states for ratification. And of course, now you had to have three fourths of the states to ratify. And at that time, that meant 36 states. And very quickly, a lot of states, particularly the ones that had already franchised women by state action, ratified. Uh, it went all the way through that fall and into the winter and into the spring. And by the early summer, they only needed one more state and everybody thought that Delaware was going to be that one. And then unexpectedly, they declined to ratify. They voted it down. And the suffragists were, were just horrified that with the November 1920 presidential election coming up, that women might not have the vote by then. And they were very fearful that if they didn't get it by then, that they would lose their momentum. And as it turned out, the country went in a strongly conservative direction after 1920. So their fears were well justified that their chances would have been very low if they had not gotten it when they did. So what happens? They start searching for a state or a 36 state. Unfortunately, there was no state that had, that was still meeting. So it meant that some governor had to declare a special session. And eventually what happened is that Woodrow Wilson got the governors of North Carolina and Tennessee to have special sessions. North Carolina met first and they not only turned it down, but large numbers of them signed a letter to the Tennessee legislature saying, follow our lead, uh, don't be intimidated, don't be pushed into this, uh, fight this to the last ditch and then some, like your Confederate ancestors, that sort of thing. So it comes down to Tennessee. And the fact that it was a Southern state was a really big deal because most of the Southern states by this time had refused to ratify. Kentucky, Arkansas, and Texas ratified, but the rest of them did not. In fact, Alabama and Georgia were fighting one another to be the first one to adopt a rejection resolution. Call, and there was a plot that was instigated by a uh, former governor of Louisiana uh, to get 13 Southern states to all reject it and then demand a rejection proclamation from the federal government. So in other words, there was just tremendous opposition. And so the suffragists were quite right to be worried when it all came down to Tennessee. So that summer, the you know, Tennessee suffragists had a major fight on their hands, all the while having this tremendous weight of responsibility on their shoulders. So the antis and the pro-suffrage, they showed up in, to Nashville in mass and they all got hotel rooms at the Hermitage Hotel. So now we're finally down to what's been known as the War of the Roses. So tell us about the final vote and the War of the Roses and the symbolisms 
So when it all comes down to Tennessee, all the um, supporters and opponents get to work. That includes the people from all over the country, the leaders of the women's suffrage uh, movements, the two movements, and, and the leaders of the opposition. Uh, Carrie Chapman Catt herself comes to Nashville, gets a room at the Hermitage and stays a long time. Josephine Pearson, who's the leader of the opponents in Tennessee, comes to the Hermitage and stays a long time. So everything's happening at the Hermitage. Uh, both sides have their headquarters there. And it's right there next to the legislature, of course, and the legislators are coming and going. High up on one floor, uh, the liquor industry uh, had a hospitality suite where they were, you know, one year after prohibition had been declared, where the liquor was pouring freely, uh, and allegedly a lot of bribes as well. The suffragists had long since adopted the color yellow as their symbol, dating back to Kansas in the uh, 1860s and the sunflowers being a symbol. And they had kept this yellow color all these years. And so the supporters of women's suffrage began wearing yellow roses especially, and the anti-suffragists took up the color of, of red. And so they were wearing the red roses. And so you could, everybody was, uh, you know, you, there's that expression, wear your heart on your sleeve. Well, they were wearing their vote on their lapels, you know, walking around the Hermitage Hotel in Nashville. You could easily tell who was on what side. Earlier in the summer, Carrie Chapman Catt said to the Tennessee suffragist, find out what stance every member of that legislature has. Make a list, publicly announce it, and then see what happens. She said, what you're going to see is that all these, many of the ones that support it are going to gradually drop off that list as the summer goes along. By this time, she's a very battle-hardened person, and she knows the power of the liquor industry, textile manufacturers, uh, and the railroads, uh, and other corporate interests that were against women's suffrage. And she also knew how much sentiment there was in the South against the women's suffrage movement as an outgrowth of the anti-slavery movement and people calling the 19th Amendment just uh, another version of the 15th and opposing it as they opposed any kind of federal intervention, as they put it, in the affairs of states when it came to elections. So it was incredible. Uh, the press was calling it the War of the Roses and comparing it uh, to fierce battles that had been fought in Tennessee during the Civil War and saying it was the Battle of Nashville was never quite as fierce as this, that kind of thing. And so it, uh, they're in the heat of the summer, um, the whole world watching. Tennessee legislature has this, makes this decision with its momentous consequences. We had the really famous Harry Burns story and everybody loves to tell the Harry Burns story. Do you like the Harry Burns story? I do like the Harry Burns story. I, I have heard uh, some people say that they don't like it because in the end, uh, it was uh, indirect influence, the mother's influence that uh, supposedly saved the day rather than all that hard work that the suffragists had been doing for 72 years. But I reject that interpretation because when you think about it, uh, all of the women who were engaged in the women's suffrage movement had been engaged in persuading men to change their minds on this. Not just Harry Burns mother, um, women couldn't vote. Uh, so it was men who were, to, who were deciding this and there's no two ways about it. Uh, that's what the women's suffrage movement was about. Obviously you're trying to persuade the public in general, getting more and more women uh, in the movement and on your side to help you persuade these men. But in the end, they were the ones that were going to decide, and, and they did. And Harry Burns' mother helped them get the last vote that they needed. Would you tell us about the letter that she sent him? 
the Tennessee legislature is finally, after much debate, and uh, about to vote. The Tennessee Senate had already approved it, and so all eyes are on the House of Representatives. The Speaker of the House, Seth Walker, was a turncoat in this story. He had originally promised to support women's suffrage, but as the legislative session opened, he changed his position and in fact led the forces against it. So on this fateful day, as he opens the session, everyone is tense because they pretty much knew how most people were going to vote, but there were a few that they weren't completely sure of. The suffragists were, were no longer counting on this young man from the mountains, 24-year-old legislator, the youngest member of the Tennessee legislature, Harry Byrne, who had voted with the antis uh, in an effort to table the amendment and was wearing a red rose. As it turned out, Harry Byrne was sympathetic to the women's suffrage movement, but he was under enormous pressure to vote against it. And then as they began to call the roll, everyone was very surprised when Harry Byrne, the youngest member of the legislature, 24 year old Republican from the mountains, cast his vote differently from what everybody expected. What everyone didn't know was that just before he had come to the session, he had gotten a letter in the mail from his elderly mother. And in that letter, she had said to him, I haven't heard in the papers how you are going to vote, but when it comes to you, don't keep them in doubt. Um, you know, be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat. Uh, and it urges him, you know, vote for it. If it comes to you, vote for it. And so he does. And there, people are just shocked because that now means that their woman suffrage movement is going to win. Happy ending. So Harry Byrne is immediately accused of of having been bribed, but he clearly publicly announces that in the end, uh, he thinks it's his the best thing a boy can do is to listen to his mother. Okay, so he's since he's very open about who it was that persuaded him. There's a great deal of attention also on his mother, Feb Ensminger Byrne, and she is a. a college educated woman, pretty rare in that time period, someone who followed the news and who supported women's suffrage. The anti-suffragist began to hound not just Harry, but his mother. We know that the antis didn't give up when that vote was taken on the 18th of August in 1920 and that they continued to um, to try to stop Tennessee from being the last state, the, the perfect 36, um, that Seth Walker changed his vote so that they could engage in this parliamentary maneuver so that there would have to be uh, uh, another vote uh, to avoid a quorum. Uh, a lot of the anti-suffragists you know, got on the railroad and went to Alabama. Uh, the press mocked them as the Red Rose Brigade but these supporters were able to get enough people to have the, the, the vote and they reaffirmed its support, their support. Thereupon, Governor Roberts signs the bill and then it's sent by express mail uh, to DC. They are up there, they're waiting for it, watching for it, aware of what's going on and um, they wake up the Secretary of State, Bainbridge Colby, in the wee hours of the night, who gets up and without any ceremony or, or without the representatives of the suffrage organizations, anybody else <clears throat> signs and therefore certifies the 19th Amendment. And finally, 
you would think it was over. <clears throat> but the anti-suffragists continue to take it to court. And it was not until 1922 when the Supreme Court finally dismissed the last one of these cases, and, you know, ruling against them. It's really incredible the lengths that, that some of them would go to try to stop women's suffrage. Were there black suffragists? Definitely, there were black suffragists. Um, in the early days, of course, um, the black women and white women worked closely together in the women's rights movement as they did in the anti-slavery movement. Uh, Sojourner Truth, of course, is, is one of the most famous among them, uh, a woman who had, had been born and worked in slavery in New York State back when they had slavery eventually escaped and became one of the best known speakers uh, for justice with regard to race and, and to women's rights in the country. Um, and there were many others who were uh, involved in the women's suffrage movement in those early years, including women in the Fortin family, uh, Harriet Fortin Purvis. Uh, she and her husband were very involved in uh, the Underground Railroad uh, and they were both supporters of women's suffrage. And then when the 1869 split happened, um, they divided into different ca camps. Not m more African-American women went with the AWSA, not surprisingly, probably because they continued to support the 15th Amendment. Um, but what happens is that in the late 19th century, the National American Women's Suffrage Association is desperate to get the South on its side. And they recognize um, the, how racism in the South is one of the key obstacles, but they cater to it in the sense that they felt, they knew that they had to get some Southern congressmen to support it before they could ever get the two thirds of each house that the constitution requires for an amendment. They also knew that when it came to the ratification process that they were going to have to have some support in the South. So Laura Clay of Kentucky, who's sort of crucial in the woman suffrage movement as an intermediary between national suffrage leaders and Southern suffragists um, helps it says to them in a famous letter in 1892, you can work for ever, but if you don't bring in the South, you're never going to win. You got to bring in the South. And so she works with them. What's, what I have described in my scholarship is that, that in the 1890s, the race issue actually is still a huge obstacle to the women's suffrage movement, but it also was something that was actually exploited by national leaders and, their, and the Southern white women who got involved in the 1890s um, as a way to get through this problem I've just described, to overcome the racism and in fact to use it to their advantage. And they were, they're borrowing an idea from Lucy Stone's husband, Henry Blackwell, who was so much committed to the anti-slavery cause that he wants to you know, risk his life to, to rescue a young girl who was on a train and being returned to her master. So, you know, he's not doing this because he is a racist, but he explains to the South, hey, you have a, about the same number of, of uh, white women as you do African-Americans so you will actually meet your goal of restoring white supremacy if you grant woman suffrage. What's happening here uh, is horrifying to us now looking back. Um, and it's another example of what was happening nationwide, which is that the suffragists had realized that very few men were going to be persuaded by just the justice of woman suffrage that you had to show them that there was something in it for them, some political gain. So you had to have, in other words, an expediency argument. They also argued if you enfranchise 
women, you do not have to take the vote away or to virtually disfranchise black men because uh, there are more white women in the South and they will outvote them. You will actually see a liberalization uh, instead of, of um, risking congressional wrath and the threat that's in the 14th Amendment that your representation in Congress would be reduced. So they try that argument in the 1890s. But of course, these Southern white conservative men who were in power in the South at the turn of the century were not only impassioned about uh, preventing black men from voting, but they are also trying to hold on to this Southern um, way of life, a phrase they were always using, to keep the kind of hierarchies in terms of sex as well as race that had been a part of their lives before the war. Now, by 1903, it became clear that this argument of using woman suffrage as a way of, of restoring white supremacy was not going anywhere, and that the Southern men who were in power at that time were going to use other means to accomplish their goal of white political supremacy. And so the movement kind of died out at that time because whereas a lot of these white women wanted the vote in order to support reforms, uh, to things that would benefit the whole community, as well as to expand women's rights, the, the argument that they were using, the tactic, was based on exploiting this moment in the political history of the South. And when that moment had passed, they, they felt like it was sort of hopeless. But then in the last 10 years of the woman suffrage movement, something is very different. First of all, there's a whole string of victories out in the West, uh, 1910, 1911, 1912. That gives people more hope. And also they have a new expediency argument that works all over the country. And that is the gift of the progressive movement, which was a political movement uh, supporting reform that swept the country in the early uh, decades of the 20th century. And it was calling for a more activist government that would take care of citizens better. So many people, middle class, professional class, were really drawn to this movement. And lots of women, who, including women who were in women's clubs and civic organizations around the country, this appeals to them very much, and they want to do something about um, corruption, and they want to do something about um, open sewers in neighborhoods and lack of playgrounds, and they're very upset about child labor, and they favor laws to get rid of that, and they favor laws to have compulsory education so that these children would have to be taken out of these mills and sent to school. So as a lot of women are working to support reform, a lot of the men who are in politics who want their support become big supporters of woman suffrage. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt is a very clear example of that. Not in his first presidency, but as he was trying to become president again and forming this progressive party uh, actually appoints one of the leading suffragists in the country, Jane Adams, to have her introduce him at, and put his name into nomination at the convention. And in the South, um, it really helps not only to encourage more women to want to vote, um, but encourages more men to, to see their support as valuable to them. I wanted to, to like tie up the loose ends or give us a little bow at the end. Um, are any um, lessons to be taken from the women's move, uh, suffrage movement? To me, the most important thing to, to take away from studying all this is to, is to realize um, that this was, this was a very complicated movement that went on for a long time. 
and the people in it, three generations of, of, of suffragists who became more and more diverse as time goes by. And that's exactly what was required in order to succeed. Because as the founders of this country, framers of the Constitution, wanted the Constitution to be able to be amended, they didn't want it amended lightly or frivolously. They didn't want some temporary fad that appealed to people in only one section of the country to be added to the Constitution. And so they put all these obstacles in the way of amending the Constitution. So to, that meant that no movement that is considered to be really radical at the time could possibly be amended to the Constitution. And so the suffragists had a real challenge on their hands. They had to uh, persuade the public that suffrage was a good thing. Uh, they had to persuade the politicians. And they also had to gain support all over the country. The real story, the overall story of the women's suffrage movement's success in 1920 is how a movement begun as radical by a small number of people in one section of the state finally was able to gain the nationwide support that was needed in order to succeed. So the suffragists just had a monumental task on their hands. And so the story overall is one that is sometimes inspiring, sometimes depressing when you look at some of the compromises that they made. But there's so many inspiring stories too of, of, of women working together across their differences. A number of prominent suffragists who were white and who were black were founders of the NAACP. One of the things I take away from it is it was a huge victory. It was incomplete because of the fact that many states did not allow African-American women to vote, uh, that it would take another half century before the Voting Rights Act of 1965 finally makes the government enforce both the 15th and the 19th Amendment. Finally, we're able to have universal suffrage in this country for the first time. And then for another several decades, the federal government uh, renews the Voting Rights Act, which was not like a permanent part of the Constitution, say, but an act of Congress that had to be renewed. And so for another 40 years, you have a movement trying to make it easier to vote. And now in our own time, we have things are moving backward again, and that there are so many people who are trying to actively restrict the ballot, making it harder to vote. And we know who they are. And so the point is that you can gain the vote, but you can lose the vote. And that having the right to vote doesn't necessarily mean that you are able to get past all the obstacles that people put in your path. And so the, suff the takeaway is the suffrage movement is never really over. Um, voting, even in a republic, in a democracy, is a, a right, but it's one that you have to keep fighting for. And also that you really need to use. And so I'm always telling people, don't ever miss an opportunity to cast a ballot. Uh, as Carrie Chapman Catt said on August 26, 1920, people fought long and hard for you to have this right, prize it. Thank you very much. We appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. I wish you could have come. Me too. Well, Tennessee is not only has a lot to be proud of, but it's so nice to see how proud you are. And all these statues that have gone up and now you have another one. I mean, it's just great. There's nothing else like it. I know. Harry Burns' mother has a statue now. <laughs> I love that. Isn't that, isn't that fantastic?
It is. Thank you very much.